Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown, the show where we decode things. It's right there in the title, isn't it? It's a skeptical show where we uh, come across some concepts like what Danny's written for me today, following in the footprints of the Devon Devil. And then we tell you why the Devon Devil's Devon. Oh, God damn. It's going to be a pronunciation, like not a pronunciation, but like a speaking. Devon Devil. Devon Devil. Devon Devil? 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 Doesn't matter. Let's carry on, shall we? Danny writes it for me. I've never read it before. We're going to uh, sh over the idea that devils are real. <laughs> I'm sure. Let's jump in. The winter of 1855 was colder than a politician's heart. Between January and March, the temperature had rarely risen above freezing in the UK, and the southwest countryside of Devon was largely hidden underneath a carpet of thick snow. This was back in the day when winters were real winters, snowmen were real snowmen, and icicles formed proudly on the dangling testicles of farm folk who weren't going to let a spot of bad weather ruin their weekend. The conditions were even worse in the north of England, but everything's always worse in the north. Danny can say that because he's from the north. If I said that, it'd be considered racist. Back down south, the snow fell as heavy as ever over Devon and the chill on the chilling night of the 8th of February as two of the region's rivers, the X and the Tain. <laughs> no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. E-X-E and T-I-G-N. And I know people will be like, Simon, they're in your country. And I'm like, yeah, but your country's also real big. Like, whatever country you're in, unless you're like in Vatican City or something, your country's big. You don't know all the names of the rivers. They froze over like glass, but this time the snowfall appeared to have brought with it something else. The residents of the villages, scattered across the bottom half of the county, awoke next morning to discover that a visitor in the night had left a remarkably long trail of footprints in the snow that defied logical explanation. Already, already, I'm like, it's a prank. It's a prank. When was this? 1855. People are way more gullible in the past. Like, they'll believe all sorts of shit. And then the more close you get to the future, or to the present day, sorry, not to the future, but I'm sure the future as well, the more elaborate things need to be for people to believe. Like, in the past, you'd just be like, yeah, well, I just got this thing made out of woods that looked like a devil's footprints, and I mashed it in the snow. And people were like, oh my lord, it's the, the, the second coming of Jesus. Or like, uh, not the second coming of Jesus, that would be a good thing. What's the bad thing with the horsemen? Four horsemen? It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh my days. Just before we continue with today's video, ever wondered how to tackle dry skin during the winter? Well, worry no more because our sponsor today, the UFO 3 by Foreo Sweden, has the answer. Look. I'm a dude who's not like always been super big on skincare, but this is fantastic. It offers deep facial hydration. It's more than just a little gadget. It, uh, look, I don't know. I get dry skin in the winter and it's nice to have this, which, uh, means my skin is less dry and unpleasant. And I itch at it, which isn't nice at all. In just two minutes, this device increases moisture by 126%. It's clinically proven to reduce the look of wrinkles in just a week. For example, they got thermotherapy. Not only does it soften the skin for optimal hydration, but it's like a warm hug for your face during those chilly months. Plus, there's more. They've got a range of LED lights in here, which fight signs of aging, soothe stressed skin, and more. Just download the Foreo for You app. You use the mask that comes with this, and then you select your treatment on the app and boom, easy. So hit the link in the description below. You'll get an exclusive 21% discount on the UFO 3, but that's only for the first 100 customers. So grab it for yourself, grab it for a loved one, and give the gift of deep hydration and a spa-like experience. Thanks to Foreo for sponsoring and now back to today's video. They stretched out in a sinister pattern and moved in mysterious ways, which were impossible to attribute to neither man nor beast, and the exact nature of the footprints has still yet to be conclusively identified. So what exactly was it that got the national press into a belated frenzy and spooked the Devon locals to the degree that they became afraid to leave the house, their houses? And could it be that the devil himself descended on the denizens of Devon on that dark, direful night to demonstrate his disenchanting dance of death? Jesus Christ, Danny. You're making it hard on purpose and I don't like it. You're pushing me to the limits of my ability as what's essentially just a fancy reader. <laughs> I deserve to be adored by a man, yet here my dreams like dormant. I don't mean to get mordantly morbid, but did I get all adorably adorned to get bored manning doors? No more. <laughs> I realize that Simon has probably already yelled out no at this point, but I'm going to put the haunted cat amongst the zombie pigeons by suggesting that the answer might be yes. Yes, he did. No, he didn't, Danny. No, devil's the devil's not real. Hell's not real. None of this is real. Could be wrong, though. There's only one way to find out. At least I hope I <laughs> like Simon die. Like I do, I'm not so. 
I'm about to say, I was about to say that I believe in an afterlife or say something that resembles that. Let's just say I find it extremely, extremely improbable. If it does exist, it's the same way that, what was that Sims family called? in the original Sims. It was called, like, was it the Simonians or whatever? And it would be like, okay, let's imagine that old Bob, or was it Jeff, from the Sims family, like in Sims 1 when you fire it off, he dies in a fire, right? And then, but you're like, oh no, so you don't save your game and you reload Bob's Sims house. And I promise I'm making a point here. I believe that maybe we live inside, like, some fancy computer simulation or whatever. Don't really believe that, but I don't think it's impossible either. I think it's much more likely than the idea that people who go to, like, church or mosque or synagogue or whatever your place of worship of choice is, that the idea that that afterlife, that's infinitely less likely to me than the idea that we're all just living in a computer. So my idea of an afterlife could be like, yeah, you just didn't save the game, or it's like, when this one's over, you start it again, or something like that. I don't think that's impossible. I think it's extremely unlikely, and then you wouldn't know it, because old Bob from The Sims is just like, he doesn't remember burning to death in a fire. He just got reset. He doesn't know. Maybe we've already already been reset. But this isn't amateur philosophy channel. This is Decoding the Unknown. So let's crack on. Fire under my feet. Depending on which of the many contemporary news reports you believed, it was either a baker or a farmer who was the first of the early risers to spot the footprints. One baker from the town of Topsham reportedly raised an eyebrow when he found mysterious tracks near his shop whilst he was getting ready to open up for the day. Perhaps not being the most inquisitive of souls, he shrugged them off until he began to hear further reports throughout the day of strange footprints popping up all over the place, which formed quite an epic trail. Meanwhile, a farmer got in to more of a flap when he saw the same set of curious footprints on the same morning approaching one of his barns. They appeared to stop dead at the barn door, and the farmer naturally began to grow concerned about the welfare of his animals inside. He needn't have worried. The animals were fine and dandy. But after closer inspection, he was shocked to find that the set of footprints appeared to just carry on outside the wall of the barn, right across the top of the roof. It was as if the night prowler had a problem with the concept of opening doors, but had no difficulty at all in just walking right up the side of any structure that happened to be in his way. That sounds extremely unlikely. I'm already like, well, that would be hard to fake. But it'd also be like, now I'm like, is there actually any evidence of this? 1855, did they have cameras and stuff? No, it's probably just some dude being like, yeah, man, guess what? And it's just like a ghost story that got more embellished over time. As the morning drifted hazily into a bleak afternoon, word had quickly spread around the region that some strange and quite possibly dangerous creature had been wandering around the snow-clad countryside in the middle of the night, leaving unearthly tracks in its wake, prompting immediate suspicion that it was either the devil, a giant sea monster, what, or a northern tourist. <laughs> oh, God. Some of the locals instinctively grabbed their guns. They're like, oh... <laughs> There's a northerner down here, is there? <laughs> Uh-oh. I dashed out to catch the scent while others adopted a calmer approach and took the time to draw sketches of the tracks and try to figure out just how far they had stretched. Devon's the place. It's in Cornwall, right? Where everyone talks like a pirate. I made a video about that once. It's a fascinating story. At least I found it fascinating. It's like, you know why pirates talk a bit like this? And they sound like they're from the West Country, where I'm pretty sure Devon is located. Is because some dude who played like a pirate in a movie, like back in the day, like one of the first pirates or some shit like that, was from Devon or was from the West Country. So he had this like West Country accent. And then everyone who played pirates from that point on used his like West Country accent because that's what they associated with pirates, even though obviously had nothing to do with pirates because pirates are like over in the Caribbean doing stuff. They're probably not from the West Country. <laughs> I mean, they could be. Maybe some of them did come from the West Country. Some of the locals instinctively grabbed their guns and dashed out to catch the scent, whilst others adopted a calmer approach and took time to draw sketches of the tracks and try to figure out just how far they had stretched. <laughs> it's the past. It's like, how are we going to document this? Well, get out your paper and pencils, chaps. <laughs> Later on, <laughs> I know I'm making fun of it, but it's like, obviously, that was the only thing that they could do. God, I'm so glad I'm not in the past. Like, I know when I was young, when I was like a kid, the 1800s seems like an infinite amount of time ago. But not really. Like, now I'm an adult and I'm 36. I'm only like, well, it's only like four or five lifetimes of my, uh, four or five of the amount of time I've lived and would be like back in the 1800s. And I'm like, that's pretty nuts because I feel like I've not been around for that long. So it really makes me think the 1800s are not that long ago. My like grandparents are born like, what, 1930s? Maybe late 1920s? Something like that. 
And so their grandparents would have been like born like around this time. And that's kind of nuts. Like someone I knew, I could have asked them. I didn't. <laughs> Should have done really, shouldn't I? Tell me about your nan nan. That been kind of, it's like, that's real back in the day, isn't it? Real back in the day. And then, sorry to belabor this point, but isn't it also nuts that my kids could probably will be alive in the year 2100? Which is crazy. That's like fully in the future. <laughs> Everyone's like, yes, yeah, Simon, that's how time works, son. <laughs> yes, I know, but it's crazy still. <laughs> well, maybe it's not. Later press reports indicated that this single trail of unbroken footprints dragged on for somewhere between 40 to 100 miles, or 60 to 160 kilometers, trekking across as many as 30 different towns during the creature's night ramble. The first sightings appeared to be near Exmouth, uh, but then the trail traveled up to Topsham and then crossed the estuary of the River X before heading to Dawlish and Tainmouth, with additional reports suggesting that the trail then stretched as far south as Totnes and Torquay. Oh my god, these town names. Like, I've heard of Torquay. It's spelled Torquay, but I'm pretty sure it's Torquay. But none of these other places I've ever heard of. I've been to Devon, like, at least several times. I think I've got a family who live in Devon, or at least lived in Devon at some point. You're in the West Country. And I've been there on a long bike ride, but I don't really know much else about the West Country. I know they have, like, is it is it scones? Is a scones from the West Country with, like, the cream and the jam? Delicious. Don't worry if you're not fully absorbing the geography of this. I live in the county right next door, and I know all about Devon. And it's got this really good model village in Babacoon with railway loops and fire-breathing dragons and stuff. You can save up to 10% on a ticket if you book things in advance. Danny, are you trying to slip in like a sponsor? <laughs> are you getting paid for this, Danny? If you are, we need to disclose. <laughs> the point there is that this was... And also, you need to give me a slice. <laughs> and there's a pretty long journey for any creature, human or otherwise, to have undertaken in a single night during a severe snowstorm. Wow way back in the days when electricity was yet to light up the streets of the country villages. But it was the nature of the tracks that got some of the locals cowering beneath the bedsheets in terror. The cloven hoofprints trampled into the snow had clearly been made by a biped creature planting one fruit in front of the other rather than a four-legged animal that might have just escaped from a farmer's barn. A cloven hoof is the kind divided or of a kind of divided or split hoof that you might usually expect to see on cattle or go or on cattle or goats or pigs or deer which traditionally come with four legs only traditionally though like if you want to go for a non-traditional goat two legs bipedal goats real thing not true but these tracks appeared to have been made by a two-legged creature which was forming footprints that were just over four inches long three inches wide and somewhere between eight to sixteen inches apart so if they were made by a man it would have been a man who took very a very small shoe size but had a pretty impressive stride rate in fact considering the size of the trail and the length of time his journey took it would have been bopping along at around 17 miles per hour good lord that one bops longer that's like a full-on sprint Wait, can you even sprint that fast? No. Yo, ChatGPT, what's up? Um, I'm wondering, like, how fast people sprint. Like, if I am just a regular dude, I have it in my mind that if I whacked the treadmill up to 15, that I could just about sprint at 15 miles per hour. Is that at all accurate, or am I just thinking about kilometers an hour? Like, and also tell me, Usain Bolt, the really quick dude, how fast does he sprint in miles per hour? So... If you're thinking about sprinting at 15 miles per hour on a treadmill, that's actually pretty fast, especially if you're not a trained sprinter. Um, most average people can sprint somewhere between 8 to 15 miles per hour, but it really depends on your fitness level, sprinting technique, and experience. As for Usain Bolt, the legendary sprinter, he set the world record for the 100 meters with a time of 9.58 seconds. Good lord. That translates to a peak speed of about 27.8 miles. Holy shit! Record run. Uh, that's, incredible. that's so fast! Also, okay, I'm pretty sure I could, like, this was back in the day when I used to run, um, and yeah, I'm pretty sure I could do 50 miles per hour for a very short amount of time. So, 70 miles per hour, is like, that's extremely quick for a person. Usain Bolt, 27 miles per hour. <laughs> he could be chasing a fucking car in a village. 
It would also have to be a man with a very unusual walk, as these footprints, and some say they were branded into the snow as if feet were as hot as iron, were also in a dead straight line with one foot planted perfectly after the other. This doesn't exactly resemble the slightly wonkier footprints typically made by a human, regardless of whether or not said human is staggering home after a heavy night on the source. In fact, it was the unswervingly straight and unbroken nature of the tracks which caused the locals to really start biting their fingernails and digging out their Bibles for comfort. The visitor was clearly not one to deviate from its chosen path. This entity had traveled through villages and cemeteries and rivers and hedges and giant haystacks without feeling impeded by any obstacles it came across on its defiantly straight journey. Just as the farmer had initially noted, some of the footprints were found to walk straight up to the walls of buildings and carry on across the roof before coming back down again on the other side. In other cases, the footprints stopped at the bottom of small drain pipes, no more than about four inches in diameter, before coming out again up near the gutter. And whilst the marks were also initially thought to have stopped dead when the visitor approached an estuary of the River X, the trail was later picked up again directly over the other side, as if the creature had just glided straight over a two-mile stretch of water and then resumed its unwaveringly straight and crunchy trek across the snow. It seemed that it either knew exactly where it was going or it hadn't quite figured out how to take left and right turns yet. On an even more disturbing note, there were also reports that the tracks led right up to the front doors of cottages before disappearing again, as if the visitor had passed right through the homes of victims to curse their souls before popping out through the back door. As one eyewitness from Exmouth reported, the marks came right up the front gardens within a few feet of the house, stopped abruptly, and then began again at the back within a few feet of the building. So, to sum up, we're looking for a biped creature with cloven hooves of fire who can walk up walls, leap across rooftops, glide across water, yeah, glide across two miles of water, and squeeze through drain pipes. My first thought was that it could be a particularly determined Jehovah's Witness, but then I decided it was probably just a surprisingly athletic two-legged goat. So there you have it. Join us next time on Decoding the Unknown, where we'll be investigating just how much hamster you really like to find in a hamburger. Ooh. <laughs> I doubt very much, just because of the economics of it. Like, hamster's probably not something, you know, it's like rats and stuff. You'd be like, yeah, I mean, it's a bit weird, but you could probably imagine that, like someone catching those rats and putting them in it. But why are we talking about this? <laughs> rat. This is a rat burger. Not bad. Danny, that made me go on a tangent. We shouldn't be on that tangent. We should be figuring this out because we're not really ending here. We've still got like 20 pages to go. Ah, oh, wait, now I'm being told in my earpiece that neither of those answers really tickle the boxes. We're going to have to plow a little deeper to see whether the Prince of Darkness really did dance through Devon on their bitter night in 1855. The Devil's in the Detail the Devil's Footprints certainly left their mark on the local press over the next few days, or to be more accurate, the papers were talking about the Devil's Hoof Marks. Although the word footprint has been knocking around since the 1550s, it wasn't used quite as much in the 19th century as we didn't yet fully appreciate the forensic value of a footprint, and we were just as likely to use simpler terms such as footmarks or foot tracks to describe the impression of a creature's foot that's left behind on a surface. Now, I never thought of it like that, but I suppose that makes sense. Or in this case, hoof marks to describe the impression of a demon's cloven hoof strutting across a snowy rooftop. But whilst local papers such as the Exeter and Plymouth Gazette wasted no time in reporting on the curious hoofprints, the national press weren't so quick off the mark. In fact, it took over a week or two before the mystery finally began to make it into national papers such as The Times, which included the following observations in its belated report on February the 16th. Quote, it appears that on Thursday the 8th of February, there was a very heavy fall of snow in the neighborhood of Exeter and the south of Devon. On the following morning, the inhabitants of the above towns were surprised at discovering the footprints of some strange and mysterious animal, endowed with the power of ubiquity, as the marks were seen in all kinds of unaccountable places. There was hardly a garden in limpstone where they were not observable. The impression of the foot closely resembled that of a donkey's shoe. Okay, <laughs> a present. Was it a hoof? Was it like a demon hoof thing? Or was it a donkey's shoe, which I assume is something like a horseshoe? A present, it remains a mystery, and many superstitious people in the above towns are afraid to go outside their doors after night. End quote. Now, over the course of the next few days and weeks, the national press actually got into a bit of a lather about this, and the letters page were heaving with speculation as to what harmless or ghastly creature could be responsible for causing so much panic. One early regular correspondent went by the pen name of South Devon, but was later revealed to be a guy called William de Urban, a local man who described himself as an experienced hunter with proven pedigree in tracking wild animals in the snow. Over the course of his many letters to the Illustrated London News Magazine, the world's first news magazine to feature pictures, albeit fancy illustrations, rather 
rather than paparazzi photographs, William de Urban was quick to rule out some of the more reassuring suggestions from readers which involved the tracks being made by humans, birds, donkeys, or, I don't know, penguins. Yeah, all of this is more likely than what this dude's probably coming up with. He'd be like, it was the devil! He observed, at present, no satisfactory solution has been given. No known animal could have traversed this extent of country in one night, having besides having to cross an estuary of the sea two miles broad. Neither does any known animal walk in a line of single footsteps, not even man. As the speculation grew in the newspapers, and within the feverish imagination of local residents, it appeared that all the signs were pointing to a visitation from the bowels of hell. After all, if the prince belonged to neither human nor animal, then surely they could only belong to Lucifer, who was roaming through the county in search of sinning souls, even going so far as to try a bit of doorstep cold calling, despite the slightly antisocial hour. I don't understand. People in the past, I know they're weird, but it's like, yeah, yeah what's that? It must be the devil. It's not a prank. No, it's the devil. Just that's immediately where they jumped to. The past, everybody. Some of the locals got it in their heads that it was all because several churches had made recent changes to the traditional prayer book, which had opened a portal between hell and the earth and given Satan an opportunity to take a mini break in Devon, even if it wasn't the best time of year to hit the beaches and the nightclubs. Others claimed that the devil had managed to get in through the back door, following a recent significant drop in church footfall, which had weakened the bond of faith and subsequently weakened God's ability to protect his loyal flock from the temptations of evil. (laughs) That makes sense, but it was the past. People would believe this. People would still believe this today. Just less people. And less. And less with every passing year. It's perhaps more likely that the stinky weather had played a part in the drop of church attendance, but it's reported that some crafty vicars were promoting the idea that the lower turnouts were to blame for the devil prancing around the countryside, as they figured this might get some more bums on seats. I suspected that they had to place a bigger order for communion wafers in time for the following Sunday's service. Of course, one of the main reasons why so many people assumed that they were witnessing the tracks of the devil, quite aside from the more supernatural aspects of his long journey, is because he would seem to be one of the very few suspects to fit the description of a biped with cloven horns. Yes, and Harry Potter fits the description of a boy with a scar on his face probably carrying a wand, but that doesn't make him any more real. Having never knowingly met the guy myself, I'm having to rely on descriptions of the devil from other sources, but that's a bit more difficult than I first thought. He was never really depicted at all in the earliest forms of Christian artwork, and he was never even properly discussed in the passages of the Bible. Really? So where's the devil come from? The only clue we get is that Lucifer the Lightbearer used to be a stunning angel back when he was part of the in-crowd, and since his fall from favor, he had taken to disguising himself as, wait for it, a stunning angel of light, which sounds a bit like Wile E. Coyote adopting the cunning disguise of Wile E. Coyote. But there's no reference as to what kind of physical transformation his true form was supposed to have undergone in the meantime, if indeed he changed his appearance at all. It wasn't until around the 9th century that we first began to see artwork of Satan, which depicts him showing off his groovy new horns and his proper hairy legs and his swishy goat tail and all those funky cloven hooves. He was also given a new pitchfork to wield this time. And this was probably because Christianity was traveling right around the world for the first time, and the concept of the devil was getting mashed up with a whole bunch of other celebrity deities, including, most notably, Pan, a god from ancient Greek religion and mythology, who was rocking the look of a biped half-man, (laughs) half-goat. It's like, that guy looks demonic. Let's make him the devil. So the idea of a cloven hoof devil was always a borrowed concept in a way, and even the most fervent Bible basher shouldn't necessarily have jumped into the conclusion that cloven hoof marks were evidence of the devil coming out to play. An alternative, but equally frightful theory, is that the visitor was Springheel Jack, the cloaked figure from the Victorian era with ghoulish facial features, clawed hands, and eyeballs of fire, who was reported to have struck terror into the hearts of British citizens as he somehow leaped incredible distances in a single bound and larked about on rooftops like a tit. Pretty sure we've made a video about that, but it was a while ago, so I've forgotten the details. But maybe check out the video about Springheel Jack on this channel? Maybe, if it exists. Maybe it doesn't. Who knows? Not me. Not going to look it up. The t- <laughs> Quality work there, Simon. Thank you. The time frame certainly fits, as sightings of spring Jack were reported between 1837 and the turn of the 20th century. And it also fits with the idea of our mystery Devon night prowler leaping around rooftops and jumping over walls, even if spring Jack wasn't usually known for squeezing inside tiny drain pipes. However, it's generally accepted that spring Jack was an urban legend who is now more famous for his appearances in later works of fiction, eventually evolving into a heroic costumed Avenger and a very early version of a comic superhero. Besides, although spring got around England quite a bit, he never thought 
thought to travel as far south as Devon. But whatever the identity of this long-distance rambler, he or she or it had the locals getting all jittery the following day as groups of big men with guns launched a hunt for the creature on a mission to make it die, whilst everyone else bolted the doors shut and wondered if they'd ever dare to leave the house again. Even a vicar joined in a small hunt that took place as far south as Torquay, although he may have been brandishing a Bible rather than a gun. But the dogs that accompanied this group weren't mad keen on the idea of sniffing out the devil. After they were released into the woods, it was glumly noted that the hounds came back, baying and terrified. At this point, it seemed that the group lost their nerve and headed back home. Perhaps a one-off dance from the devil, which nobody was hurt, may not have seemed so bad in the grand scheme of things. It's not like he even caused any damage to a single drain pipe. The biggest fear was that he might raise a lot more hell during a swift return visit. And it's not like this is the only time in history that sightings of sinister footprints have been reported and never conclusively identified. Yet none of the other footmarks ever made quite such an imprint on the hearts and minds and sheds of the public as the ones that were made on that bitter night in Devon. The 19th century was a particularly popular period for fearful findings of fantastical footfall. A little earlier, in 1840, an epic four-year voyage of discovery led by famed explorer Captain James Clark Ross had taken his crew to the Kerguelen Islands in the southern Indian Ocean. Oh my god, that's far away. Can you, like, in the past, 1840, it's like, yeah, 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 you go on one of these journeys, it's like, you might not make it back, you're gonna be gone for years. <laughs> it's like, now you're just like, I just went to India for three days. <laughs> And it's like, bang, it's just, it's just crazy. You're like, yeah, I'm at home. Now I'm in India. Now I'm at home again. And it's like, crazy, crazy. And back in the day, I'd be like, that would be like <laughs> years of your life. Years of your life. During an exploration of one completely deserted island, the crew were mystified when they stumbled across fresh hoof prints in the snow, which were around three inches long and two inches wide and shaped a bit like a horseshoe. As Captain Ross himself later observed in his 1847 documents of the voyage, quote, Of land animals we saw none, and the only traces we could discover of there being any on this island were the singular footsteps of pony or ass found by the party detached for surveying purposes, end quote. Now, you reasonably expect to see hoof prints in the English countryside, which is heaving with hoofed animals, but it's more surprising when there's not a single creature of any kind in sight. However, Captain Ross was back in England during the sightings of the Devil's Hoof Marks in Devon, and as he didn't bother to venture an opinion on the matter, we can perhaps assume that he didn't see any connection himself. Moving right to the other ends of the UK, there were multiple reports of mysterious tracks popping up around two Scottish glens in the 1840s, stretching across a range of 12 miles. As reported by the Times, quote, The print of the foot in every respect is an exact resemblance of that of a foal of considerable size. As no one has had the good fortune yet to have obtained a glimpse of this creature, nothing more can be said of its shape or dimensions. Only it has been remarked from the depth to which the feet sunk in the snow that it must be a beast of considerable size. In the very same year that the devil stalked Devon in 1855, the Illustrated London News also reported that mysterious footprints were a regular occurrence on the hills of Piasco Agora in what we now call Poland. A respected doctor of medicine in the area revealed that unidentified marks popped up on the snow and in the sand all year round, and that the locals happily believed them to have been caused by supernatural influences, as they could not be attributed to any known animal. But it does seem that the devil is especially attracted to Devon, possibly because he's partial to a bit of clotted cream and a gallon or two of strong cider. If we leap forward in time to the 1950s, we can read a report from an anthropologist and physical researcher, Eric Dingwall, who seemed convinced that a businessman by the name of Mr. Wilson had come across an unusual hoof prints in the sand on a remote Devon beach. These prints differed from the trail found nearly a century earlier, as they were not cloven, and they were a whopping six feet apart, which suggests that the devil was either in more of a springy mood this time, or he had grown considerably since his last visit. But the other curious thing is that the prints just started from nowhere in a closed beach with challenging accessibility. According to Eric Dingwall, quote, The beach was a comparatively narrow space, completely enclosed by rocky headlands on either side. It looked as if each mark had been cut out of the sand with a flat iron, starting immediately beneath the perpendicular cliff and ending in the sea. There was no returning track. This story failed to generate widespread attention in comparison to the 1855 sightings, and neither did a much more recent story from Devon in 2009, in which a great-grandmother from the village of Wolsey believed that the devil had finally come back for another dance after all this time. 76-year-old retired government official Jill Wade awoke one March winter morning to find cloven footprints in the snow that had fallen on her back garden, and they closely resembled the bewildering size and pattern of the original marks 150 years earlier by a biped with cloven hooves. These are, these are pranks, right? It's all gonna be pranks, or just people making up stories for attention. <laughs> Remember to breathe! Oh, 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 oh. 
because it's <laughs> there's just no evidence that it's real so far. Jo was so intrigued by the prince that she got in contact with the Center for Forty and Zoology, who sent round their top guy, Graham Inglis, to investigate. Whilst Graham admitted that he'd never seen such strange footprints in his life, he remained skeptical that the prints were made by the devil and thought it more likely they were made by hopping rabbits or hares. Sensible man right there. What is Fortean zoology? What is Fortean? Like, zoology is the study of animals, right? What is Fortean? Look up. Uh, okay, so, oh, it's like, there's some dude called Charles Fort, right? Uh, this is series knowledge, apparently, although drawing from Wikipedia. Uh, was an American writer and researcher who specialized in anomalous phenomenon. The terms Fortean and Fortiana are sometimes used to characterize various such phenomenon. Okay, so it's kind of like crypto cryptozoology or whatever in a way isn't it like isn't that it feels like just a more acceptable way to say that and even this dude is like nah it's just a rabbit it's nothing weird and i specialize in weird shit. and whilst the center for forty and zoology was unable to conclusively crack the case the owner of the center jonathan downs felt that there was probably a very natural if elusive answer he said do i believe the devil comes from the pits of hell to wander around the gardens of north De north devon <laughs> of course not too right. He's clearly a South Delva Devon kind of demon. Whilst there are no definitive answers to any of these other sightings, there's also not much to investigate and not much in the way of evidence aside from the vague testimony of a few individuals. And I can't help wondering if Jill Wade had just lost the plot after retiring from the wild and crazy life of a government official. I suppose you could say that there's also a distinct lack of concrete evidence for the 1855 walkabout. The press may have been packed full of speculation and theories and rumors for months afterwards, but there were relatively few first-hand accounts of the actual event from named sources, and it's not as if everyone was taking photographs or filming themselves following in the footprints of the entire journey. Still, we haven't quite reached a complete dead end, and there's at least a little more evidence than I first suspected. A whole box of contemporary documents, in fact, which had been stashed away in the corner of a church to gather dust for about a hundred years. Interest in the story had largely evaporated by the turn of the 20th century. But interest was rekindled in the 1950s following a series of retrospective articles printed in the thrillingly named local pub publication, Report and Transactions of the Devonshire Association. I love that people, like, kept such good records. You'd just be like, yeah, it's kept somewhere. Like, why? <laughs> why? Just burn it. Just recycle it after a while. Inspired by the first of these new articles, historian Major Anthony Gibbs undertook a little detective work and found himself snooping around a church in Clice St. George in East Devon, where he came across the box of documents hidden away in a parish box. Although, like, old documents are cool. We had a sponsor, um, My Heritage. Uh, it's months ago, maybe a year ago now. And they gave me access to their, like, look into your family tree thing. And it was so cool. Like, this isn't sponsored, but it's like, you could, I got all the way back to, like, my great-great-grandparents. And you'd, like, you could dig up, like, census forms from them. Like, these giant A3 census forms that they'd filled out in, like, quill and ink and stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah, there's my grandmother's name, like, surname. And there's, like, all the people who lived in the house are like, who are these people? And then you can look up the address on Google Street View, and it's like, whoa, that's where my family lived, like, a hundred-something years ago. It's really cool. So, I know I, I like that all these old documents can be, like, searched and digitized these days. The box contained a pile of correspondence from its parishioners, which contained details of individual sightings and stories, along with a big stack of letters from other vicars in the region who were responding to Reverend Ellicombe's requests for their take on the matter. The box also contained a sample of contemporary tracings and sketches of the hoofprints, which the Reverend had been collecting from his parishioners for analysis. Whilst it's half interesting to take a glimpse of these hurried sketches put together by witnesses who were on the crunchy ground at the time, you could probably get a very similar sample of results by just giving a crayon to a small child and asking them to imagine what a cloven hoof mark might look like. <laughs> My kids would be like, what does cloven mean? What's a hoof? What's a hoof mark, Dad? <laughs> and I'd be like, it's like a foot. And then they'd draw a line. and be like, Dad, it's a line. And I'd be like, yeah, it is. <laughs> so it's definitely, they're, sorry, they'd be like, it's a foot. And I'd be like, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's just a line. <laughs> Lately, my my daughter draws people like she draws like mum and dad and her brother and her in like these little pictures. And she's like, oh, no, I forgot the fingers. And she draws on these massive fingers. So we're all like these, you know, the blobs. And then you have like the arms and the legs growing out of the head because that's 
how kids draw people. And then they all have these massive, super long fingers, and it looks so creepy, but also sweet at the same time. Perhaps the most intriguing documents of all were copies of letters that Reverend Ellicombe had apparently sent to the Illustrated London News, but with the words, not for publication, scribbled prominently across the top of each page. Well, why are you sending your stuff to the press if you don't want it to be published? It's like, listen, I know what you do is publish stuff that people might be interested in, but don't publish this one. It's off the record, okay? So why are you sending it? The paper had agreed to his request, even if they must have been wondering why he was bothering to send them at all. So this was now the first time in a century that anyone had been able to view the secret letters, parts of which were eventually published in Report and Transactions of the Devonshire Association a century later. Throughout the private correspondence, Reverend Elacum clearly outlined his own thoughts and findings on the perplexing prince. He wrote, There is no doubt as to the facts that thousands of these marks were seen on the snow on the morning of the 9th, extending over many miles of estuaries. Reverend Ellicombe has seen the marks for himself outside his own church, and he went on to describe the accounts given to him by what he described as credible eyewitnesses from around the region, who all gave broadly similar descriptions of the shape and size and impossible patterns of the prints. The Reverend's faithful dog also reacted in a similar manner to the dogs belonging to the other vicar dude from Torquay. Of his own brush with the devil, Ellicombe observed, The creature was on my own premises, and these marks were visible three days afterwards. My dog barked that night, and so did the dogs of my neighbors where marks were seen. For his last party trick, Reverend Ellicombe had scooped up a small pile of white grape-sized excrement which had found himself alongside the trail of footprints. He posted this to the highly regarded naturalist Sir Richard Owen to try and get an expert's verdict on the special winter parcel. But although the vicar kept a copy of his own letter, he doesn't seem to have received or at least saved a reply from the naturalist. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that dude was like, bro, did you just mail me a little sh No, I'm not looking at that. You weirdo. <laughs> my, oh my, wait till old man Clemens realizes it's a bag of sh <laughs> Poop again! <laughs> he caught the sh <laughs> Perhaps Sir Richard Owen, much like myself, is of the opinion that it's not worth responding to people who post through your letterbox. <laughs> Bang on. It's worth pointing out that whilst Reverend Ellicombe appeared to be fascinated by the origins of such unfathomable prints and even began pondering over the notion of a strange winged beast descending from the sky, he never once suggested that the devil was responsible for making them. Yeah, it seems like things that make these, I don't know, birds. Birds also have that, like, claw thing going on, don't they? Birds have claws. If not hoofs, and a claw is sort of like a hoof, right? And he appeared to be a man who had studied the matter in more detail than anyone else at the time. Maybe we can just take his word on that for now. I mean, I can't conclusively disprove that the devil didn't go dancing in Devon that night, but maybe there are alternative theories that we can examine first. Besides, I always imagine Satan's have slightly bigger feet. But if it wasn't old Nick, then who or what the devil could it have been? Idle hands at the devil's workshop. Before we turn our attention to potential culprits from the animal kingdom, one of the first theories that sprang to the more rational mind is that the whole thing was just a very human hoax. Considering the vast scope of the trail, it seems unlikely that it was all down to just a couple of meddlesome school kids or miffed vicars just pratting about in the middle of the night. It would need to be more of a highly organized movement which perhaps had a clear motive for such a great undertaking. We've already mentioned that some clergymen were reported to have played on the idea that God was punishing the citizens of Devon for abandoning their faith, and they were hoping that fear of further visits from the devil might help push church attendance figures back up a bit. But could religious inner circles have been responsible for the marks in the first place? There was certainly a significant drop in church attendance during this period, as well as a growing conflict with the Church of England. The recently formed Oxford movement was keen to restore the Catholic heritage of Anglicism and bring back medieval traditions rooted in weird ceremony and ritual investments and, I don't know, half-time jersey swapping. Yeah, I'm glad that didn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really? It's already too much. In contrast, the Puritan Anglicans were horrified at the prospect of returning to such old, outlandish ways and felt that the Oxford movement were on a mission to hijack the modern Church of England. It's speculated that a large group of Puritan Anglicans were responsible for creating the devil's footprints in a bid to convince everyone that God was unhappy with this growing trend and that followers of the new movement were slowly dragging the people of Devon into hell. It's true, the churches and vicars do appear to play significant parts in the story, as if the whole thing rotates around churchyards and the opinions of clergymen. This might largely be because there wasn't much else going on in Devon at the time. 
The reason that we didn't hear any reports of footprints appearing in the Babacoon Model Village and the Milky Way Adventure Park is because they hadn't been built yet. But proponents of this theory note that the footprints popped up in many of the churches which specifically supported the Oxford movement, whilst avoiding many of the churchyards of the loyal Puritan Anglicans, almost as if the perpetrator was sending a very clear message. Yeah, it does seem like this, but it's also like quite impressive how they managed to do this without like leaving their own footprints in the snow to like cover their how are you covering your tracks in like fresh snow and then making them so far apart and then climbing up buildings it's quite impressive i don't think it's real but it's like if that how if it wasn't down to a clash between rival factions of the church of england then maybe it was down to a clash between rival groups of travelers the idea wasn't released into the wild until 1973 when manfrey frederick wood wrote his memoirs in the life of a romany gypsy Within the pages of the book, Wood recalls an old story told to him by his uncle, which Wood states would have taken place in the neighboring county of Somerset. Now, you might think we can disregard this one straight away, as we're not even talking about the same county here, but Wood also concedes that his memory is hazy and he's not entirely sure of the date or location. He also mentions that the event caused major news headlines at the time, leading some to draw the conclusion that Wood is either actually recalling the events that led up to the Devil's Footprints in Devon, or that the footprints stretched even further than we first imagined. It's actually quite difficult to tell the story without using words that might get us demonetized, so we're on safer ground if we just refer to the rival groups of travelers as Romany and non-Romany. The Romany ancestors of Manfrey Frederick Wood were growing concerned that their territory was being taken over by rival groups, and so they spent 18 months planning an ambitious operation which was designed to scare away their rivals for good. I know so little about history, or this bit of history, that I'm like, wait, what are the other non-Romany group? that we're not mentioning because of demonetization. I don't know what that would be. Someone in the comments is for sure going to say it, but I'm like, I don't know what that is. The Romany travelers had what they perceived to be a powerful advantage on their side. They knew that the non-Romany lot were a superstitious bunch who were scared of encountering the Mulo on their travels. The Mulo is a kind of vampire or revenant from folklore that took on the persona of a recently deceased person whom it held a grudge against and then used their body to roam through the countryside in the middle of the night, seeking out fresh blood to suck from travelers' camps. The Romany group is said to have assembled no less than 400 custom measure stilts, which were used by seven different Romany tribes who marched through the county all night in an attempt to fool their rivals into believing that the Mulo was very much on the prowl in the region. The operation proved to be a walkaway success, and the non-Romany travelers fled their camps in terror and decided to set up home in a slightly less haunted environment. The 400 measure stilts sound like complicated contraptions which had boots planted at the bottom of them and were designed to make identical prints across the landscape in a precise straight line with an identical stride length. They also could be straightened out and turned into step ladders, which could then be used to make prints visible up walls and across rooftops. Well, boom, that's it. Mystery solved. This is already infinitely more likely than the devil thing. So this is, unless there's other, this is a much more reasonable explanation. This was quite a different method from the one allegedly used by the purist Anglicans, who were rumored to have just shoved a horseshoe on top of a long pole to make all the prints in the less immediately accessible areas. The problem with the traveler's story is that it doesn't really fit in with the narrative of the devil's footprints. It's not just the fact that Manfrey Frederick Wood can't be sure of the location or the time frame. Yes, it could have been Somerset or Devon in 1855, and it could also have been Skegness in 1927 for all we know, but it's also that the details don't match the story. Wood doesn't give much of a description of the hundreds of identical boots that were supposedly used by the Romany groups, but I can't imagine the boots leaving cloven hoof marks in the snow. Even if they did, the cloven hoof marks don't have any particular association with the legends of the Mulo, who took on the form of recently deceased people, who presumably didn't trot around on cloven hooves. But yeah, this is the past. You could just like make people believe all sorts of crazy shit. Be like, yeah, yeah, he looks like a human, but when he leaves his footprints in the snow, they're devils. They're like devil's hooves. When he looks in the mirror, he sees only the devil. You could make people, people would believe this because of the past. They really believe anything. The size and stride of the prints left behind by the Romany travelers also didn't match up with the prints found in Devon. Maybe there is some truth to the idea that the Romany travelers pulled off a similar stunt at some unspecified place during some unspecified time, but it has nothing to do with the devil's footprints in Devon. And whether the prints were supposedly made by travelers or clergymen, the whole idea of a hoax orchestrated by humans just seems incredibly unlikely considering the scope of the trail. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, what's more likely? That it's actually the devil? No. It would have been a mammoth task for even large groups of people to pull off in a single night. And whilst there wouldn't have been many witnesses knocking around during the middle of a particularly bleak winter night, 
It's surely inconceivable that not a single person was alerted to the presence of hundreds of travelers or mad vicars roaming around Devon and shuffling up and down gardens with stilts and poles to create imprints up walls and across rooftops. Maybe that's what Reverend Ellicombe's dog was barking at. But such chaotic midnight mayhem would have aroused more attention than just a few dog barks here and there. I reckon it's more likely that the prints were created by an entirely different animal, which was just minding its own damn business rather than trying to pull off a silly prank. But what breed of earthly creature could have left such a bewildering trail? Wild Wildlife The extra flying post came up with a very early suggestion from a bloke who reckoned he'd found the answer when he stumbled across the very end of the track and encountered the very creature that had made them. The man from Torquay who had been following the strange marks found in his garden when he saw that they came to a complete stop, at which point he came face to face with the beast. Well, he's just waiting there. <laughs> he's just standing there for hours waiting for someone to catch up to it. It sounds like he'd just been spontaneously following his own curiosity, so the poor defenseless chap wouldn't have been carrying a gun and wouldn't have had the backup of trembling runaway hounds to rely on. All he could do was stare into the eyes of the beast and pray for a quick death. Or maybe not. What he actually found was a toad loitering suspiciously around a tree stump. And this was enough to convince the man from Torquay and the extra flying post that the very same toad was the sole culprit behind all the footprints. It was a very busy toad then, isn't it? And what's, how's it jumping up onto a barn? I know toads can jump high, they've got big legs. But onto a building? A toad certainly would have found it a bit easier to hop through a tiny drain pipe than a typical human or a goat. But bear in mind that toads have webbed feet rather than cloven hoof prints. I think we could quickly rule out a single toad going on an extended jaunt across Devon. Another popular early suggestion that never really took flight is that the marks were created by birds. Reverend Ellicombe had noted in his correspondence that some of the marks were accompanied with strange little flurries in the snow, which could have been caused by birds flapping their wings to shake off the ice before taking off again. But again, whilst birds could easily have been flapping around in gardens and across snowy rooftops, their webbed or clawed feet don't match up with the description. And when the suggestion was brought up in the letter pages of the Ill Illustrated London News, one astute reader took the time to point out, quote, Birds could not have left these marks, as no bird feet leave the impression of a hoof, nor could it proceed in the direct manner stated, nor would birds, even had they donkey's feet, confine themselves to one direct line, but hop here and there, the nature of the mark at once sets aside its being the track of a bird. But one theory, which certainly did gather momentum for a while, came from yet another vicar who was keen to stick his oar in. This time, it was Reverend Musgrave from Limpston Church in East Devon who delivered a, re a revealing sermon to his flock during the height of the press frenzy, which was picked up by the Illustrated London News. Reverend Musgrave knew exactly what kind of animal had created the footprints. A kangaroo? Yeah, all those kangaroos in Devon in the 1850s. Obvious, really. One of the reasons why the prince had created such confusion and mystery in the first place is because the country folk of Devon would have been more than familiar with all manner of marks created by the local wildlife, and the fact that these particular marks could not be easily identified suggested that they were made by someone or something quite out of the ordinary. I don't imagine that you saw too many honk kangaroos hopping around 19th century Devon, which is why the locals have been scratching their heads for so long over the deeply unconventional imprints. And again, this is going to be a very, very busy kangaroo. Like, it was all over the show. But surely that also puts forward a very good case against the kangaroo theory. What would a kangaroo be doing hopping around in the middle of the night in Devon? If it had somehow got lost, then it must have taken a pretty serious misbounce at some point. Reverend Musgrave had an answer for that. This wasn't just a random stray kangaroo in the wild. It had escaped from the zoo. Or at least Musgrave had heard from a credible source that it had escaped from a private menagerie somewhere in Sidmouth on the English Channel in Devon. According to the report from the Illustrated London News on the sermon, quote, In speaking of Satan as a tempter, who was continually besetting our path, though invisible, Reverend Musgrave aptly alluded to this mysterious visitor who had left behind him visible evidence of his presence and expressed it as his opinion that the footprints were those of the kangaroo. But it must have been a busy animal indeed to have played up such pranks as this creature has done. It's so hard reading stuff from the past. Like, I know, I'm sure people in the past were like, oh yeah, it's very readable. But now it's like, you what with a what? And then this happens? English has changed so people no one's gonna be watching these videos in like a hundred years. But if you did stumble across this video in a hundred years, in which case, hello, I'm long dead, um it would be you you'd probably not really be getting what I'm saying. I'll be using all this slang and sh and people would be like, why does he keep saying and sh what does what is an and sh 
Yes, it must have been a pretty busy kangaroo. And whilst there were indeed a couple of private menageries in Sidmouth, which may well have hosted a kangaroo, there were no reports at the time of one bouncing over the gates to freedom. But it also been quite tricky for a kangaroo to cross the two milish stretch of the estuary of the River X, and their paws wouldn't really have left the same kind of marks as a cloven hoof. This kangaroo theory sounds a bit nonsensical, to be honest. I mean, much more credible than the devil thing, but still, like, this is a bad theory. Although quite a few people accepted the kangaroo theory for a while, it later transpired that Reverend Musgrave had only jolly well got a made up the whole thing to calm the fears of his frightened flock. In a letter to the Illustrated London News, the man himself sheepishly admitted, I certainly did not pin my faith to that version of the mystery, but to the state of the public mind of the villagers, dreading to go out after sunset under the conviction that this was the devil's work. Rendered it very desirable. Oh my God, people in the past, what are you saying? Rendered it very desirable that a turn should be given to such a degraded and viti- vitiated notion. I was thankful that a kangaroo served to disperse ideas so derogatory. All right, mate. <laughs> what are you saying? He's basically like, I was chill- I, I needed them to chill out, yo. I suppose it's kind of nice that Musgrave wasn't one of the vicars trying to instill the fear of God into his parishioners by making out that the devil was coming after them. But I'm not convinced that he should have resorted to deliberately fibbing to his flock to banish their worst fears. And again, it could be argued that telling porkies from the pulpit is part of the job description. Yes, yes, it could be argued that, because it's true. Sticking with the Illustrated London News for a while. Oh my god, we've been sticking with the Illustrated London News for this whole video. I want to go look up. I wonder if the Illustrated London News still exists. Probably not, because photography came along. Another correspondent with a bit of pedigree wrote in to offer his theory. You may remember that Sir Richard Owen was the acclaimed naturalist who received a parcel of excrement in the post from Reverend Ellicombe. While Sir Richard didn't appear to respond to the sh- post, he was happy to pen a letter to the paper which outlined his theory that the culprits were clearly badgers. He explains that badgers were the last plantigrade animals known to roam England. In other words, they walk with their toes and midfoot bones flat on the ground as opposed to digitigrades who walk with their toes and heels permanently raised and ungular grades who walk on the nails of their toes and hooves with their heels and digits permanently in the air. There's animals that walk on their nails. That sounds painful. I mean, I'm sure it's not for them. But that's weird. How did that evolve? It's like, yeah, we walk on our nails. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) Sir Richard argued that a badger's claw could leave... The badger's claw sounds like a pub. (laughs) Could leave surprisingly large marks, which are similar to the ones found in Devon that morning. He also pointed out that badgers are known for traveling long distances at night in search of munchies, and perhaps most significantly... A badger plants its back feet in the exact same tracks made by the front feet, creating the misleading impression of biped footprints. Really? I'm learning all sorts of stuff about badgers today. Fascinating. Even the most energetic and hungry badger would have accomplished quite a staggering feat if it had made all the prints single-handedly in one night, but Sir Richard reasoned that the tracks were likely to have been made by several different hungry badgers spread out across the region and at either side of the estuary. Now, I'd rather listen to a respected naturalist than yet another vicar getting hot under the collar about winged beasties and escaped kangaroos, even if Sir Richard never actually saw the prince himself. But the badgers would surely have come to rest every now and then, rather than just plowing on relentlessly like wind-up toys, and whenever they stopped for a breather, they would have revealed all four of their paws in the snow at various stops across the trail. And again, Sir Richard fails to address some of these key aspects to the mystery. Yeah, but Sir Richard has done a better job than anyone else so far. Because it's like, oh yeah, Sir Richard, he's so dumb. But also, the other people were like, it's the devil! It's a kangaroo! And Sir Richard's like, might be a badger. Could be a badger. That sounds like an interesting idea. That would be my hypothesis. I like Sir Richard. Unless the badgers had bitten, had been bitten by radioactive spiders, I can't see how they would have scaled the walls of houses or bounced across haystacks. Yeah, not to mention crossing that two miles of river. Perhaps Sir Richard wasn't even aware of all the aspects of the story at the time of writing his letter, in which case he should have made sure that it opened all the brown parcels in his own mailbox before penning letters to the newspapers. But I don't feel that badgers tickle the boxes on this one. There's another guy with a more recent take on the matter whose opinion I'd trust more, as he's probably researched the saga more exhaustively than anyone else in history. 
Welsh writer and historian Mike Dash first published his findings in the 40 and Times in 1994 after collecting just about every scrap of primary and secondary evidence that he could possibly get his hands on. This included a whole archive of contemporary newspaper clippings, alongside the big box of documents compiled by Reverend Ellicombe, which had been discovered in the 1950s. While sifting through all the different ideas and theories that never quite answered all the questions, Mike Dash grew attached to a theory first quietly put forward in the letters pages of the press back in the day. At least some of the prints could have been made by hopping rodents. The idea of a mouse hopping such great distances might seem absurd, but mice and rats are known to spend a lot of time hopping, particularly when they're trying to navigate their way across challenging territory such as the thick carpet of snow. More specifically, the humble hopping wood mouse would have left marks quite similar to the ones reported in the papers, as it holds all four feet together when jumping in the air, thus creating a single and fairly substantial footprint, the unusually formed pattern of which is not entirely unlike a cloven hoof. Also, unlike, say, kangaroos and badgers, a wood mouse would have had little problem in squeezing through drain pipes or even climbing a vertical wall as long as the surface is not too smooth and has pen plenty of wrinkles and cracks, like, say, the grooves and bumps you might typically find on the stone wall of a 19th century cottage in Devon. It's perhaps the most credible answer we have so far. Yep. Mine too, until like the badger one was my favorite, and now this is my new favorite. Even though it doesn't quite explain every element of the mystery, and Mike Dash isn't trying to claim that it does. Good. No one should be trying to claim that it does. It's just, unless you come up with the ultimate solution and no one can question it. For starters, you would expect the people of Devon to have easily identified the tracks of rodents as the county would have been crawling with mice and rats. It also doesn't make sense that different groups of rodents could have created a single uniform trail of footprints which spread out for many miles. And whilst they're very capable of hopping about, I'm not sure they would have been hopping up and down the gardens of quite so many houses in the region unless they were just doing it for the squeaks and giggles. Still, it's probably the most realistic, animal-related theory we have to work with for now. Other slightly more improbable suspects to have been put forward over the years included a domesticated swan, which had escaped from Germany whilst wearing special padded shoes to prevent it from damaging the garden. An incredibly rare animal called a uniped, which was supposedly last spotted in Iceland in, an a thousand, in 1001 AD, but was actually just made up by the writer of a letter published in the press, or an as yet unidentified breed of Arctic bird, which had lost its way quite dramatically. What I think at this point in today's episode, is that a lot of the original details were embellished. Like, this happened a really long time ago. It's all just eyewitness testimony of stuff in the snow. I think the one with the river crossing, it's like, yo, a mouse or whatever it was walked up to the river and then, like, didn't cross the river. And then on the other side of the river, a mouse picked up... There was another mouse that walked down to the river. It didn't cross the river. Like, that's absurd. Wading even further into outlandish waters, it's also been suggested that the prints were surely made by some kind of sea monster. It's certainly true that the majority of the mysterious footprints reported over the years seem to have been spotted very close to the sea. Yeah, but sea creatures, like we just talked about a swan, and it's like, that goes in the water, and it's got webbed feet. Like sea creatures, sea monsters, they live under the water, they don't have feet, they have like flippers and shit. This goes right back to when Captain James Clark Ross first discovered those unaccountable prints after his epic naval voyage sailing to the Karuglia Islands. Whilst it was speculated at the time that the tracks may have been made by a mighty sea creature, Captain Ross himself felt that it was more likely to have been a donkey or some other wretched animal which had been cast ashore from a damaged ship. Oh man, it's gotta suck to be that donkey. It's like, no, don't leave me here! But the aquatic theme has preserved through multiple sets of prints found in the coastal county of Devon from between 1855 to 2009, including, of course, the set of prints found on a closed beach in the 1950s, the trail of which read right, led right back to the sea, perhaps an indicator that the sea creature was returning to its home after a splendid night out on the town. It's not something we can conclusively disprove, but that's never our responsibility. But the curious sight of a giant sea monster with small cloven hooves would have surely been glimpsed by at least one resident of Devon over the course of up to a hundred miles unless it was invisible. And while we're at it, we can't conclusively disprove that the marks were made by a mischievous two-legged centaur, Mr. Tumnus from Narnia, the old leather man of Connecticut taking a surprise vacation on one of Santa's reindeers, which had escaped from the North Pole, which is why we don't have to prove we don't have to disprove anything. Come to think of it, that last idea would explain a lot. I'd put a fiver on it being Ruby. She was always the naughtiest reindeer. But let's back up a minute. Maybe we're looking at this all wrong. What if the mystifying footmarks weren't created by any kind of real or mythical creature at all? Secret Journey British novelist Geoffrey Household. It's a curious name, isn't it? <laughs> 
Jeffrey Household. Household's his name. <laughs> He's a household name. Trying to work out a good joke here, but I'm not really coming up with anything, so let's just move on. First put forward a theory in the 1930s that the prints were created by something else entirely. An experimental weather balloon which had drifted astray. Bro, what is the smallest weather balloon ever? With, like, little claws attached. I must admit that I have just poured another strong coffee, and I'll check to see what I was supposed to be writing about here, as I felt for a minute that I'd accidentally leaped over and into entirely different decoding the unknown script about UFO sightings. But don't panic. I don't think I've lost the plot just yet. Jeffrey Household was a prolific writer of thrillers, often containing minor supernatural elements who grew up in Devon listening to old stories about the devil's hoofmarks. When Jeffrey was just a boy, he also heard a story from a local man by the name of Major Carter, whose grandfather had worked at the naval base Devonport Dockyard during the time of the footprint sightings. Major Carter claims that the base had been developing some kind of secret experimental hot air balloon, which would give the Royal Navy the ability to monitor approaching weather systems. The balloon was supposed to be securely moored at Devonport Dockyard, but during the night of 8th of February 1855, a spell of nasty weather may have been partially responsible for the balloon somehow breaking free from the ropes and gliding across the county. The point here is that there were two shackles right at the end of the mooring ropes, and Major Carter believed that the weight of the shackles caused the balloon to continually drift up and down. As it was clumsily dragged across the ground at regular intervals, the shackles created the curious marks across miles and miles of countryside before the balloon eventually came down to land for good in the town of Honiton, where it was swiftly retrieved by the Royal Navy. He also claimed that the Royal Navy had hushed up the incident afterward, partly because the project was supposed to be top secret, partly because they were a bit embarrassed by the whole thing, and partly because the runaway balloon had apparently caused a load of damage to greenhouses and conservatories, which they didn't fancy paying for. I suppose this certainly explains how the prints were found in such unusual places, as the balloon merrily bounced over walls and houses and haystacks and estuaries. But unless the Royal Navy was really ahead of the game, it's about 40 years too early for anyone to be developing weather balloons. Yeah, this seems ridiculous to begin with. And then, I didn't know that, but apparently weather balloons came, across, came around 40 years later, so no. It wasn't a weather balloon. There were no reports of any such damage to property on that night, and it seems highly unlikely that such a balloon would have bounced across such a huge distance without inevitably getting tangled up in a bush or a tree or a 5G mast or something. It all sounds a little bit like a story that was made up long after the actual incident. Yes, a lot of this sounds like it was just made up after the actual incident, if the actual incident happened at all. And Jeffrey Halsall never really gave much detail over the credibility of his witness, Major Carter, who may well have just been a random idiot sprouting drunken bollocks. Incidentally, speaking of idiots, many people at the time were convinced that the whole thing was orchestrated by a local village idiot. According to a segment in John Goodwin's 1968 book, This Baffling World, a group of around 30 hunters and their dogs were following the tracks the next morning when they came across the person who appeared to be making them. His name was Daniel Plummer, the village idiot of Woodbury in East Devon, who apparently had a reputation for decking himself in layers of chicken and goose feathers and then wandering through the woods making animal noises. <laughs> what, Daniel, what are you up to? <laughs> I like the the village idiot, like officially. <laughs> that was a thing, and it sounds like Daniel deserves this. But despite what the hunters seemed to believe, it would of course been impossible for the hundred mile prince to have been the work of a single man, idiot or otherwise. One final theory to chew over, which plenty of people believe has some real merit, is what if we're talking about perfectly normal footprints which were made by perfectly normal animals, but they somehow got distorted by the unusual weather conditions? It was a freakishly cold night on the 8th of February 1855, but it's possible that the freezing temperature may have dipped up and down throughout the night, which could have temporarily thawed out the snow before freezing it over again. This could have had the effect of distorting an innocent set of footprints into a new eerie shape which resembled a cloven hoof or devil's foot. So, the tracks would usually have been quickly identified as belonging to a goat or a donkey or a bird, but the rapidly shifting weather conditions had twisted and contorted the shapes into something which had never been seen before. Anthropologist Dr. John Napier has spent much of his life examining the phenomenon of Bigfoot, and he's of the opinion that many of the sightings of mind-bogglingly huge footprints found in the snow which get attributed to Sasquatch are actually just bear or yak prints which had been thawed out and frozen again to create a new weird shape that looks like it was actually made by the abominable snowman. Yes, what a sensible man. <laughs> Got a doctorate and everything. An anthropologist. <laughs> Why? Look, we should listen to him. He's a scientist. This theory gathered some traction in the letters pages of the press, although others were quick to dismiss it, including that very vocal experienced hunter who signed off as South Devon, but was later revealed to be William to Urban. Yes, should we trust the random hunter who's publishing things under a pseudonym, or should we trust Dr. John Napier, anthropologist? 
who's happy to name himself and put his credentials on the line. In one of his many letters, the, the, the urban dude, he noted, on the morning that the tracks were observed, the snow bore the fresh marks of cats, dogs, rabbits, birds, and men clearly defined. Why then should a continuous track, far more clearly defined, should be the only one which was affected by the atmosphere and all the others were left as they were? And look, he's got a good point. It, does, it just doesn't seem possible that the freak weather conditions would only affect one set of prints from the hundreds that were likely to have been left that night. Unless they're just like one specific, like, larger animal or something like that. The only logical explanation is that the imprints from the devil's red-hot cloven hooves were branded into the snow as he danced over Devon so they didn't react in the same way to the fluctuating temperatures. And as we seem to have run out of theories, I'm not sure we can pull out a more rational answer from this long and winding trail of speculation. But... Let's give it a go anyway. Who's that Pokemon? It's the devil's not real. Hell's not real. None of this is real. Okay, interesting. Let's see if there's one here that I actually believe more than all the others. I'm not really convinced by any of them, particularly. I'm least convinced by the one that it was Satan himself. But, like, there's obviously a rational explanation. Don't know what it is, though. I still like that mouse one. One Track Minds. A lot can happen in a week or two. It took around this length of time for the Devil's Footprint story to make a transition from small local papers to the national press, but it's interesting to go back to the very first local reports and note how the language of the reports had changed quite dramatically by the time it hit the national papers. Ah, like the Chinese whispers thing's going on, isn't it? It's changing over time. What a surprise! Way back in the beginning, there was no mention of cloven hoof prints, no mention of the huge spread of the trail, and no allusions to the devil. The reports merely spoke of unidentified footmarks which had popped up around the region and were generally considered to have been made by some kind of animal. How very boring, and probably the realistic answer. It was, it was an animal, and it's been super embellished over time. The first report in the Western Luminary and Family Newspaper for Devon, Cornwall, and Somerset suggested that they may have been made by a monkey which had escaped from a nearby menagerie. Yet in the space of less than two weeks, a very different story had evolved in the pages of the national press. We are now talking about a perfectly straight, single set of identical cloven hoofprints which stretched for over a hundred miles and appeared in some quite bizarre places which were impossible to explain. One of the most influential letter writers during this period was that experienced hunter by the name of William de Urban. We should point out, straight away, that William de Urban was certainly no village idiot. He went on to become the first curator of the Royal Albert Museum in Exeter. Oh wait, I'm thinking of the Victorian Albert Museum, which is in London, which is massive. So he certainly doesn't sound like the kind of chap who would chap who would deck himself in layers of chicken and goose feathers and then wander around the woods making animal noises. No, this is a different dude. Wasn't William de Urban the the guy who wrote in about it being the the animals or or something? We should also know that William de Urban was only 19 years of age when he wrote all those letters, whilst he may have been a budding hunter. Oh, he's the hunter dude, right? He can't really have had the levels of experience that the tone of his letters suggested. It's possible that his young imagination may have been getting a little carried away when he kept on banging on about identical cloven hoof marks appearing in an exact straight line in every garden and rooftop of the county whilst vaulting over walls and crossing a two-mile stretch of estuary. Even Reverend Musgrave, he's the one who came up with the escaped kangaroo theory, felt compelled to write a response to the Illustrated London News, which observed, the outline accompanying your intelligent correspondent's recital of the circumstances hardly conveys a correct idea of the prints in question. So he's like, bro, can you get it right? Like, you're just, you're just, this is not correct. You're just spouting nonsense. It's Chinese whispered its state to this. The truth of the matter is that the footprints would only have been visible for a very limited time, and it would have been impossible for a single individual or party to investigate the whole trail, particularly back in 1855, when finding transport for such a long journey may have been a slight issue. There's no evidence to suggest that anyone had been able to follow the trail for more than a few miles at most, and so aside from a few rudimentary sketches, there was no way of checking if the prints were identical. And there's no real evidence, aside from the claims of a tiny number of supposed eyewitnesses who wrote into the press, to indicate that some of the more fantastical elements of the story were genuine at all. This includes the ideas that the footprints vaulted up locked gates, passed through haystacks without making a mark, and seemingly glided over the estuary of the River X. By the way, even if the creature had managed to cross the two-mile stretch of estuary to resume its journey on the other side, this might not have been so remarkable in itself. It may have been possible to wade through the estuary at low tide, but it's probable that the estuary had completely frozen over during the night, allowing any creature, great or small, to just skate right across without too much difficulty. Or it was just another creature on the other side. Two miles is really long, so that's going to be a lot of potential other side that it could have gone to. Like, even if you cross directly across, directly across is going to be like a pretty wide span. 
I'm not suggesting that this whole thing was fabricated from start to finish. I'm pretty sure that some unusual footprints were indeed discovered by the residents of Devon over a stretch of 100 miles, but they weren't necessarily the same set of footprints. Yes, this is the ultimate conclusion reached by perhaps the most informed man on this subject, the writer and historian Mike Dash, legend, who was of the opinion that hopping mice might have caused some, but significantly not all, of the marks. It's possible that some footprints were created by animals that we haven't even mentioned yet. One eyewitness from Dawlish recalled that he saw strange marks on the morning which baffled him at first until he realized that they were paw prints from his pet cat which had become strangely distorted after the ice thawed and then refroze overnight. It may not have looked exactly like a cloven hoof print, the witness said it was more like a hoof enclosed around a claw, but an agile cat enjoying another busy night on the tiles would certainly have explained how some prints were said to climb walls and saunter across rooftops. In fact, this account might have been the single source and inspiration for all the reports of the prints climbing up the sides of houses, even though the witness clearly stated that he knew these particular marks were made by his cat. Yes, this entire Decoding the Unknown is about animals and Chinese whispers. Otters may have been responsible for some of the other strange prints found in strangely inaccessible places. As one eyewitness reported, he believed an otter had squeezed inside a drain pipe on the exterior to his house. Jesus Christ, aren't otters massive? Like, otters are big animals. Aren't they the size of, like, a big dog? I've never seen an otter up close, but it's not small, right? Or am I thinking of a walrus? Maybe I'm thinking of a walrus. Maybe I'm thinking of otter. Otters. They're big, right? They're not thinking of a drain pipe. It doesn't matter. The harsh weather conditions may have driven hungry otters further away from their usual hangout spots along the now frozen rivers, and back in the 1850s, the country folk of Devon weren't likely to be familiar with an otter's trail. Again, this single report could have been the inspiration for all the subsequent stories about the prowler squeezing through drain pipes, even though the witness reckoned it was an otter rather than a demon. And bearing in mind that the footprints looked quite similar to the ones left behind by a donkey, who's to say that some of the prints weren't indeed left behind by donkeys? The iron shoes worn by the donkeys often split in the middle, which could have created the impression of a cloven print. There were no recorded sightings of human footprints alongside the main trail, so it's not clear what a stray donkey would have been doing mooching around alone at that time of night. And one of the main reasons why this theory had been initially dismissed is because the prints appeared to have been made by a biped walking in a perfectly straight line rather than a four-legged donkey. William Durbin had been quick to poo-poo this idea in one of his many letters to the Illustrated London News. He conceded that the prints... I feel like William Durbin needed, you know, a different hobby. <laughs> he's just writing so many non like letters. He's like 19, he's writing endless letters to this newspaper. He concluded that the prints certainly looked like the perfect impression of a donkey's hoof. But as we mentioned earlier, he then went on to point out, no known animal walks in a straight line of single footsteps, not even man. But it turns out that the 19-year-old experienced hunter may not have known exactly what he was talking about. Researcher Theo Brown later concluded that donkeys are actually the only animals that can plant their feet in almost a perfectly straight line. They can? I had no idea. I'm learning so much. Donkeys, badgers, brilliant. So we could be talking about donkeys, or we could at least be talking about nearly everything we've already discussed. It's common for a Decoding the Unknown video to consider strange theories and then rip them apart to illustrate why they can't possibly be true. <laughs> and that's why I love doing it. But in this case, the answer might involve nearly all of the above. Except for the devil. <laughs> I mean, it probably doesn't include, involve an escaped kangaroo, a weather balloon, or a swan sporting strange footwear, and I'm pretty certain it doesn't involve the devil. Yes, agreed. i just forgotten about the other ones, Danny, but they're all ridiculous. But the dramatic weather conditions may have pushed certain creatures further away from their usual habitat in search of food, and the fluctuating temperatures may well have distorted many of the prints into freaky shapes. Witnesses at the time are likely to have spotted strange prints, which had actually been made by toads, birds, hopping mice, badgers, donkeys, cats, and otters, and a whole menagerie of other creatures, although probably not a giant sea monster. And believe it or not, some of the marks were almost certainly made by human hoaxers locked in that religious feud between the Oxford movement and the pure Anglicans. It's absolutely true that weird cloven hoof marks were found all over the churchyards associated exclusively with the Oxford movement, but the interesting point here is that most of these were found a whole five days after the original trail of footprints, suggesting that pure Anglican pranksters were inspired by the increasingly spooky theories emerging from the original trail, and decided to build on the fear by targeting rival churches with fake footprints to suggest that the devil was coming after the Oxford movement. But whilst all hunters and investigators and bored vicars and 
Scared dogs were examining specific footprints in relatively small areas. Other hunters and investigators and bored vicars and scared dogs were examining nearly entirely different footprints up to 100 miles away, and everyone began to convince themselves they were investigating the same mysterious trail. Yeah, they weren't. The national press then began to sensationalize. <laughs> the press? Sensationalizing things? Never! Some elements of the story and brought the devil into the equation. And this may partly have been down to the London-based papers having a bit of a laugh and poking fun at the superstitious county country bumpkins of rural Devon, who still believed that a sweating horse was a sign that had just been ridden by a witch. <laughs> Fast, what the f***? Oh, that horse is a bit sweat. Do horses even sweat? <laughs> I thought they'd be like dogs. Although oh, then horses would be wandering around with their like tongues out of their mouths, right? I don't even know what a horse's tongue looks like. I bet it's weird. And perhaps the memories of the witnesses later became as distorted as some of those refrozen footprints, leading many of the locals to believe that they really had seen a small section of indisputable cloven hoof marks created by the devil during his infamous hundred-mile dance around Devon. In truth, it's more likely that they'd seen the misshapen marks of a rodent or a cat, but that doesn't feel quite as exciting, so the instinctive tendency was to hop on the mass hysteria bandwagon created by the gradually embellished and exaggerated accounts later reported in the press. We'll never know for sure, of course, and the mystery lingers on in the imaginations of those who believe that sinister supernatural secrets washed away forever over 150 years ago. And they might be right in their belief that something else was going on during that dark and brutal winter night. I mean, after all, what the devil do we know? I don't know, I feel like I know. I feel like I know it's not the devil. And it's just like cats with the frozen and unfrozen footprints and other animals. Boom. Done. Decoded. Thanks for watching. Or listening, if you're listening as a podcast. And if you are, have you considered leaving a Spotify rating? Because that would be amazing. Thanks for being here.